The Central Pacific, longitude 150 degrees east, latitude 7 degrees north. Aboard an antiquated tug, appropriately named Hopeful, a group of divers from the Calypso, under the leadership of Philippe Cousteau, approach a group of volcanic islands in the heart of Micronesia. Within the islands is their destination, a 40-mile wide natural harbor, once one of the finest anchorages in the world, despoiled now by remnants of war. Truck Lagoon. Philippe Cousteau. The wrecks grounded in the lagoon bore silent witness to an American bombing mission of World War II more than 25 years ago. These weather-beaten relics were merely the prologue. There were over 30 Japanese warships lying on the bottom of the lagoon, and our assignment would be to dive and search for them. For the children of Trot, the remnants of war have become a natural part of the environment. Our goal lay beneath the sea. The fleet of ships submerged in the lagoon for a quarter of a century. tropical atoll on the eastern tip of the Caroline Islands. It's Laguna burial ground for a vast fleet of ships. Entering the sheltered bay, Philippe Cousteau and his team from Calypso are confronted by a ghostly display. Oxidized mementos of war now symbols of waste. Tragic testimony that a battle was fought here. The rusted residue of Truck's violent past. During World War II, Truck was home base for the combined fleet of the Japanese Imperial Navy. From the beginning of the war, its buildup was fast and efficient. Truck was the center of Japan's defense perimeter, not only the main staging area for its fleet, but also an important air base. It was called the Gibraltar of the Pacific, and it was considered the strongest naval base in this part of the world since Pearl Harbor. Most of the fortifications were built for defense against a landing from the sea, but the Allied decision was to neutralize Truk by a concentrated air attack. On the morning of February 16th, 1944, the first strike. 70 American fighter planes. Initial objective, the airfields. One hundred and seventy-five aircraft are destroyed before they can take off. Japanese air defense is quickly paralyzed. Next, the main targets, the ships anchored in Truck Lagoon. The Japanese command has ordered its warships to safer waters. Delayed by bad weather and trapped at anchor are more than 30 vessels. 
the pride of Japan's auxiliary fleet. two days, the lagoon is transformed from a naval fortress to a ship's graveyard. For a sailor, a ship is a home. And for my men aboard the Hopeful, the pilgrimage to a fleet of drowned vessels will be like exploring a sunken city. They will be on their own, far removed from the mothership Calypso. They are experienced, but young. Like the natives who greet them, they have no personal memory of World War II, its battles, or its headlines. Before leaving the Calypso, Philippe had reviewed every detail of the battle. Now, prior to diving, he and his crew look for what is left of the Japanese fortifications. I felt as though I were on familiar ground because of the research I had done prior to our arrival. I found that I was able to identify every feature of the terrain. It was as if I had been a fighter pilot during the truck raid, although I was only three years old at the time. Human et le récif extérieur. Mm -hmm. Tout le long. 40 000. Il est sorti. Ah, un, en fin de l'air. Our men have a hard time making their way through the thick tropical growth. Allez, allez. Ah. Elsewhere, jungles have erased the remains of entire civilizations. No wonder then that nature here has covered over the instruments of war. Bombed craters have been transformed into breeding pools. With time, scars from human clashes merely provide homes for creatures such as the amphibious mudskipper. The mast of a sunken Japanese ship stands like a beacon, beckoning Cousteau's divers to their first sample of truck's hidden cargo. With Captain Sequo, a local sailor, as their guide, the crew has been assured that the anchorage is safe, despite the apparent proximity of the wreck. The sunken ship is clearly visible just below the hopeful's bow. This first dive will be a shallow one. Chief diver Christian Bonassi has decided that he and his co-diver Dominique Sumian will not use aqualungs, but they will wear wet suits to protect them against cuts and bruises from poisonous fire coral, which abounds in these shallow waters. Philippe Cousteau, who will film all the underwater action during the truck expedition, checks out his camera with maintenance engineer Armand Davso. Christian and Dominique take with them their shark billies, a routine precaution in tropical waters. We'd been told by the natives the wreckage was that of a small harbor boat. But as was often the case, the truckies knew little about the sunken ships. Instead of a small boat, what we found was an armed cargo ship of substantial size.
The ship is broken in two, evidence of a direct hit. Christian and Dominique dive for 90 seconds at a time. They enjoy freedom from mechanical lungs as they make a rapid inspection of the sunken vessel's hull. On deck is heavy gear for handling freight, but there is no evidence of cargo on board. This ship must have unloaded and been preparing to return to Japan when it was struck. There is other debris nearby. They have been informed by Captain Sequo that in this area of the lagoon, a downed aircraft may be found. It is a Japanese dive bomber of the class known to the Americans as Judy's a plane which operated both from carriers and shore bases. This bullet-riddled plane, shot down not far from the airstrip, was one of the few not caught on the ground. Upon landing from Monaco, I read enthusiasm in the eyes of this young man. The same enthusiasm I felt 30 years ago when I made my first dive to a sunken ship. For us who dive, shipwrecks are adventure, mystery, human emotion. All the wrecks I had visited over the years were lonely victims. But here, in Truck Lagoon, was an entire fleet of wrecks with a story behind them. I was impatient to dive and see them for myself. Preparations for the first series of deep dives in Truck Lagoon are underway. The hopeful has anchored close to a half dozen sunken Japanese ships. Maximum estimated depth in this area, 130 feet. Captain Cousteau has called for a full-scale diving operation utilizing all the men and equipment at their disposal. Careful exploration of wrecks may well uncover previously unknown details of the historic truck raid. As I prepare to dive, the consequences of the truck raid monopolize my thoughts. I feel that the history of man is closely related to natural history. In all his deeds, man is responsible to nature, and acts of war have consequences on nature. Now I will observe the effects on this lagoon of the largest concentration of sunken warships there has ever been. I taught Philip to dive when he was four years old. He saw things then with a child's eye. Now he retains that same fresh approach in his underwater filming. To film shipwrecks, we need electrical cables for the lights. They add to the difficulty of the dives 
and require extra men. As always, I look forward to filming my father underwater, to his fluid diving style and his oneness with the sea. Moving over the starboard flank of a capsized ship, I search for a nameplate. With steel brushes, one of the diving teams scrapes clear the name of a ship. It is a 12,000-ton submarine tender, the Heian Maru. In two months' time, we will explore the wreckages of eight armed vessels, three tankers, and 19 merchant Maru's, three quarters of the sunken fleet. Another identification, a 10,000-ton cargo ship, the Rio de Janeiro, Maru. I am struck by a contrast. In the dry world above, fragmented structures loom in rusted ugliness. But here, Beneath the surface of the lagoon, the skeletal remains are fleshed out with new life. They blossom with myriads of creatures, like this gracious antedon, a sea lily. Cousteau and the Calypso's divers will make 480 dives to explore 30 ships in Truck Lagoon. And with each dive, there are new discoveries. In tropical waters, swarms of tiny fish and coral gardens provide live shrouds for dead ships. A once deadly cannon rests now, adorned. Cousteau swims to the top of a ship's funnel, thickly encrusted with coral growth. It offers a good vantage point from which he can survey the hulk below. The funnel's interior is like an underwater cave. In other waters, it would provide a coral-insulated home for large marine creatures. But here in the lagoon, the house has no tenants. Never before have I seen shipwrecks void of large fish. Where are the groupers, the moray eels, the lobsters? If there were such fish in the lagoon, these vessels would be their logical habitat. Cousteau keeps moving with an extreme economy of gesture, anxious to take maximum advantage of his single tank full of air. On the deck of a sunken cargo ship, a piece of land artillery, with its rubber tires showing little sign of decay. And on every ship, from bow to stern, there is the ever-present carpet of coral. does not grow on mud or sand. It needs a hard support, which the wrecks provide. Every rigging is a display of miniature marine life. Mm -hmm. 
Although larger fish are absent, hives of tiny, multi-hued fish move in and out of the stone flowers, the sponges, the shells. I am spellbound by this riot of blinding beauty. To move freely, effortlessly, in any direction, is a luxury only the diver knows. A gentle sigh is energy enough to slip through the jagged framework. Further exploration suddenly yields an unexpected find in the northwest anchorage of the lagoon. At a depth of 150 feet, a group of Japanese ships with cargo still on board. At such depths, divers may experience flights of fantasy. Perception is distorted, danger magnified. An operating table, underwater for 25 years. A fully equipped medical dispensary, preserved. Wheelchairs still carefully stacked. A gas mask, intact. I am instinctively cautious. On land, a roof is protection. But I am in the sea, where a ceiling over my head is a menace. One enters his own home directly. But on the threshold of submerged quarters, a diver always hesitates before entering, and then swims only a few feet at a time. An officer's quarters, empty, except for a chest, a wooden chest. Its lacquer, now black, has protected it against decay. There is no sunken treasure here, merely a handful of penny coins, worthless now. Symbolic, perhaps, of the true benefit mankind might expect from war. truckloads of food and drink. After the attack, the Japanese garrison and the people of Truck starved, while tons of food were lying on the bottom of the lagoon. The officer's mess is barren, 
What remains here is buried in a thick layer of mud. From the silt, I extract deer antlers. In Japanese mythology, antlers are said to be messengers of God, traditionally held by one of the seven wise men. There is no wisdom here. In a ship's galley, steel walls were torn apart, but fragile dishes have somehow survived the explosions which rocked this vessel. Out of the confines, a brief moment of relief in open water. Instinctively, I check the door to make sure it won't close behind us. I have been bothered throughout these dives by the strange absence of large fish. Now I begin to suspect why. These are explosives and explosions kill fish. I would soon learn that the wartime stockpiles of ammunition on the islands had been pilfered. Dynamite fishing had practically eliminated fish that take 20 or 30 years to grow. Another legacy of war. A passageway invites me to an underwater promenade. My thoughts are with the men who once walked this deck and leaned against this railing. Like all sailors on the high seas, they must have felt close to nature and at her mercy, as I feel. They are no longer alive to tell their story. I feel now compelled to investigate further their fate. We would dive in the lagoon, deeper than we had dared before. The first phase of the diving expedition is over. Nearly all the sunken ships and various anchorages of Truck Lagoon have been visited and thoroughly inspected. The explorations so far have supported the theory that Truck was poorly prepared to resist attack. The Gibraltar of the Pacific was a myth. Now, with artifacts for study, Cousteau and the divers make their ascent. It is rare to find diversion during decompression periods. But once in a while, we are given a special treat. Jellyfish come to visit. Among the most primitive creatures of the sea, they are also among the most graceful. The divers hover close to the contingency tank, an emergency supply in case of air shortage. Decompression time is up. The playful pilot fish will soon have to seek new underwater companions. The hopeful is small. It is not very glamorous, but it is floating and it is alive.
The divers will now compare their impressions. It has become clear that the two-day tragedy of truck has had far-reaching consequences. The undersea environment is still damaged, and it may take several generations before the lagoon recovers, if ever. Yet for the men, there is the exhilaration of meaningful dives. Now Cousteau plans their most crucial dive. A dive which will involve a detailed and thorough search for a lost ship. The larger Japanese ships were always anchored in the southeast, off the island of Aten. It's the deepest part of the lagoon, the most difficult in which to dive. If they can spot the ship, and if the depth does not exceed 300 feet, they will attempt the dive. Its precise location, its contents, and even its identity are unknown. An aerial survey is undertaken to evaluate diving conditions off a 10 anchorage. The crew will also look for oil slicks and other visual clues which might expose the position of the target vessel. In shallow water, they pass over an overturned tanker, split in two. The southeastern anchorage is void of any evidence of the wreckage, said to be at its bottom. Another pass is made over the area in one final search for surface signs of the hidden ship. It is to no avail. Electronic methods will have to be employed. The simple tugboat Hopeful is now transformed into a research vessel. The compass sightings are transferred to the map the landmarks establish position. Sonar soundings will register if they pass over a wreck. Okay, midship, Zek. On a the same petit echo, the same as this one. We're going to the profile de tout à l'heure. I'm bien l'impression que c'est les bars, oui. The fond monte encore. Two zero zero, Zek. Two zero zero. Twenty bars. The sonar scope registers a large object lying ahead on the floor of the lagoon, within 200 yards of the hopeful. They chart the course that will bring them directly above the wreck. They've found it. Depth close to 300 feet. A deep dive, but within acceptable range. A marker is dropped. According to sonar, the object below is a large mass of varying heights, a strong indication that there is indeed a shipwreck off a 10, unseen and untouched for 25 years. Now air is pumped into the larger deep dive tanks. This raises their temperature and causes air expansion. The tanks must be cooled so they can be filled to capacity for a dive to exceed 250 feet. Even on board the Calypso, a dive like this would present problems. On board the Hopeful, without an emergency decompression chamber, our technical facilities are barely adequate. But at least we have our latest regulators, which will allow easier breathing at great depth. And the larger high pressure tanks will increase the depth range of the dive. The atmosphere is tense. Words are few. Each man knows very well there is no margin for error.
Our men wear a depth gauge on one wrist and a watch on the other. Two vital references for the deep divers. Ça nous fait une plongée. Alors on se fera porter au palier l'ardoise pour donner les temps exacts. Philippe Cousteau reviews the standard decompression charts with chief diver Christian Bonassi. They must be memorized because a decompression error can result in permanent injury, even death. At 250 feet, the divers will enter the realm of nitrogen narcosis. It is called rapture of the deep, and it will impair their judgment. Under such conditions, confusion must be avoided at all cost. So that a diver in trouble can be instantly identified, the aqua lungs are initialed. The divers are now ready to go. Philippe Cousteau, who will film this carefully planned dive, makes a last minute check of his equipment with Armand Davso, the man who built his camera. Okay. And now Philippe, too, is ready to go. Three thousand years before Christ, Gilgamesh, the king and hero of Sumer, dove beneath the sea in search of an herb that gave eternal life. He was the first to be obsessed by the unknown. He would not be the last. down into a world where the mind blurs, where the air is thick and hard to breathe. Down, beyond the limits of safety, drawn by the unknown, resting in the deepest cavern of Truck Lagoon. Depth. 215 feet. The Cousteau divers continue their descent toward a lost ship in the deepest waters of Truck Lagoon. As they go deeper, light diminishes, the water is hazy, and visibility is poor. They swim down toward the yet unseen object. Suddenly, the ship. Anti-aircraft guns aimed up toward the sky, testify to sailors who continued to fight while the ship was sinking. I empty my lungs to sink further. I feel at ease, suddenly lightheaded. I know this is the first sign of nitrogen narcosis. Amidship, Christian finds an entry. Piles of entangled metal beds, sleeping quarters for sailors. Depth, 280 feet, another opening. A watertight compartment crushed by outside pressure. There could have been no survivors. Christian takes the lamp. Dominique will remain here to clear the cable and keep watch.
out of the deep soft silt a sailor's hat. I feel blinded, disoriented. Christian's lamp is barely visible. Nervously, I move close to the glow. The lamp's cable is my only link to the exit. From a crack in the rusted ceiling, a shoe. Only the soul has resisted rot. A still folded blanket, intact after 25 years. It's impossible. I lose my bearings. All I can do is follow the lights. I lean forward to touch where last I saw Christian. I keep the camera rolling. And suddenly, a vision of hell. This seems an hallucination, a nightmare. But Christian is real. I struggle for control. I feel something fall at my feet. And then, as if a hand had reached out to stop my retreat, I am held back. I fight it off. Christian looks at me now, sensing my anguish. He too is shaken and he points, indicating the exit. To emerge from the ship's entrails is to be born again. As we swim up toward the hopeful, I feel I am stealing away with my most precious treasure, life. Only the lack of oxygen could have prevented human remains from disintegration after 25 years in the sea. Truck Lagoon presents a mysterious blending of life and death. On the one hand, nature absorbs the artifacts of war, and on the other, she has strangely preserved them. Only centuries from now will every trace of man's folly vanish from the bottom of Truck Lagoon. after their arrival, the truck expedition team departs. They had come in the spirit of adventure. Now, as they leave on their last voyage in the lagoon, they carry with them the rueful memory of what they have found.
the issues of war evolve eventually into nothingness. But the consequences of war persist. The waste of human lives, of precious goods, and the waste of nature itself. Truck lagoon, damaged for generations to come. For the dead, it is over. It is for the living to carry the burden. In the beginning, war was the business of the chosen ones, gods and kings. The common man helplessly endured it like a plague. For millennia, war has had the inevitability of Greek tragedy. But today, individual men are concerned not merely with the consequences of war, but with the choices that lead to war or peace. And with this new awareness comes hope. As the prophetic poet John Donne wrote in 1623, every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. <laughs> 